I've intentionally tried to minimize misinformation which may arise from the publishing of this video by firstly referencing all research, whether primary or secondary, via links to the videos and articles in the video description, and secondly by the production of and translation of the transcript to 11 different languages, with more languages to be added soon. These languages are French, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, Romanian, Hungarian, Italian, German, Korean, Chinese, and Japanese, which happens to be the main demographics of ABA. If there happens to be any mistakes either in deliverance or in translations, please contact me here or on Discord. My Discord is linked in the description. Please reference said links if any part of this video is difficult to understand. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Zana. Today I'll be talking about whether ABA will be pay to earn, what pay to earn means, and the technology behind it. All parts of the video are timestamped, so skip to any part that you'd like, although being informed in the matter as much as possible is best. Okay, so a little backstory is needed here. Now anyone that's seen my original YouTube channel will remember I made a video about AVA dog tag, and I explained the reason Red Duck were facing bankruptcy with one particular detail. My information came from an inside source. Although he's not an inside source on anything AVA related anymore, being a secondary source as he is can still be of great use, and of great use he was. When the MP7 nerf took a lot longer than expected and I inaugurated the missing patch notes log, it reminded me of when I first contacted this inside source to see if I could find out what was causing such huge miscommunications and disorganisation, and so I decided to contact him again. What I wanted to know was whether what remained for AVA's developers was a skeleton crew, so the absolute minimum number of people needed to run a project, but instead I got some weird news. The news was that the remaining members of what used to be Red Duck, who were working on AVA from 2020 until the release date in 2022, all moved to We Made Entertainment, which looking at it is just another Korean games developer, right? Nope. They are a lot more than that. All of these games run on a particular application of technology, the technology being crypto. The link between gaming and crypto is that players can earn by playing, and this is coined as play to earn or P2E. This video is going to go in depth which will allow you to fully understand how AVA is related. I will first cover the basics of the technology behind these games, apply and evaluate based on the most popular, successful games, and then relate all of this back to AVA with my own opinions at the end of the video. To explain this best, I need to explain what Web 3.0 is. In the 1990s, a jump forward in interconnectivity between networks resulted in the internet and was coined as Web 1.0. Anyone in the world could view a web page, but it was read-only. Although the data was decentralized, meaning it wasn't owned by a particular person or company, it was extremely hard to generate your own content due to costs. Web 2.0 allowed people to read and write. You could create your own blog, or join a social network, but the aspect of decentralization was taken away. All data was centralized among a few conglomerates, Google, Facebook being a few. They own your data, and therefore they own you. Web 3.0 is a new iteration of the internet in which people such as you and I are purportedly given back control through the use of tokens such as Bitcoin, and I'll be using Bitcoin as an example throughout, as well as voting rights. This is dubbed Read, Write, Own. Web 3.0 works on the blockchain ecosystem, or as I like to call it, data chain, as it is a chain of blocks of data. Okay, so what is a blockchain? It is essentially a solid link between two pieces of data or groups of data called nodes or blocks. In regards to cryptocurrency, each contains a certain number of transactions. In the case of Bitcoin, each block contains data, so who's sending the money, who's receiving, and what amount, hashes which are unique identifiers similar to a fingerprint, and a hash of the previous block to link other blocks together. Blocks are validated by miners who compete to verify transactions and solve the hash, which creates another block. The more transactions, so the more people use the currency, the more people have an incentive to mine it, which allows the ecosystem to grow. This is called proof of work. There is also another new method of validation called proof of stake, which is about 99% more environmentally friendly compared to proof of work, as it substitutes staking for computational power. Ethereum is an example of a network that uses proof of stake. Proof of work requires a lot of energy and specialized hardware, which have relatively short lifespans. In some reported cases, Bitcoin mining energy consumption has been compared to that of small countries such as Austria and Portugal. Staking is the act of holding a fund from circulation. The more you hold, the higher of a chance you get to create the next block in the blockchain. Some people have malicious intent, and since computers are extremely fast, will try to change the hashes of those linked to certain blocks, which may contain a lot of valuable transactions. Bitcoin attempts to counter this by having 10 minutes delay on proof of work validations. Since blockchains are on a peer-to-peer -peer network, you will need to tap with all the blocks on the network, redo the proof of work for each block, and have 51% or more ownership of the entire blockchain, which is practically impossible. Essentially, blockchains are a neat way of moving money around. So how do current play-to-earn games utilize this system?
Since anyone can contribute to a blockchain, and since Ethereum has integrated a much easier and more eco-friendly way of validating blockchains through proof of stake, developers, publishers, and game industry investors have seen the supposed potential implementing this ecosystem into their games. Instead of a gamer playing the game simply for fun, one could be rewarded monetarily for the efforts by simply playing the game. In turn, you're rewarded with items such as NFTs or game tokens. Tokens can then be exchanged for governance tokens, which then can be exchanged for straight cryptocurrency or fiat currencies such as the United States dollar and or euros. Governance tokens are tokens in which token holders primarily get to decide the direction in which a project or game takes place. The people that have the most governance tokens are usually either investors or those most loyal to the project. Project goals are completed through smart contracts. For example, the community and investors could pool the number of tokens they desire into the contract, which holds the funds until the objective is complete. If it isn't completed, the contributors will get their money back, and this will be decided by the fundraisers. In essence, it is like crowdfunding. All contracts that are completed on time and to the community standards or above, the higher the value of the governance tokens would generally go. Since we generate them through playing the game, and it is in the developer's best interest in circulating the game tokens and the governance token, the blockchain system allows you to fully own your rewards, whether they be NFTs or skins, as you're able to convert them into cryptocurrency later on. Developers gain money back in the form of transaction fees when a player purchases game tokens, as well as the fees from selling in-game assets such as NFTs and skins within the blockchain economy. This allows the selling of rare and old items which may have been unavailable to those that aren't as loyal to the project, usually for a higher price. To visualize the system, I'm going to talk about the game Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity is a prime example of the implementation of blockchain technology. Similar to Pokemon, you breed and put cute animals into arenas for battle. Each pet or Axie has six different body parts with over 500 unique parts to select and is also categorized by its genes, meaning there are tens of millions of different Axie NFTs that can be generated. You can send them out to battle NPCs or real players and earn the game's governance token, which can also be earned by being on the leaderboards. You also earn their in-game tokens through game wins. Fees from breeding axes will go back into the treasury, which is a community-controlled and decentralized autonomous mechanism for sustainably using the funds that the game receives. The value of the in-game token also needs to be maintained. The value of the governance token is determined by the success of projects as well as the efficient distribution of available funds. Game tokens, however, retain their value as a result of the balance of their creation by the community with the use of them. Just a note, using in-game tokens is referred to as burning. In Axie Infinity, whenever you buy from the marketplace or breed new Axies, the in-game token SLP or Smooth Love Potion is burnt. These systems in theory are meant to welcome a stable ecosystem, but I'll show you later what actually happened. Now, one of the main people to inherit Axie Infinity were the Philippines. They were going through a very rough period during COVID, leaving many people, especially the younger generation, jobless. Many found out that you could earn through the game, and a lot of people actually earned more than the national minimum wage at its peak, which at the time was about 400 US dollars. Some took it further and created DAOs, which hosted guilds or clans, as well as quote-unquote scholarships. DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations. They are member-owned communities without any centralized leadership, thanks to the blockchain system. Yield Guild is the biggest organization hosting this in the crypto gaming sphere, with a side project called Axie University, which is geared towards teaching players how to get better for a small fee. Members collectively vote to decide what games they want to play, what virtual assets they invest in, and how they will use them in-game. They have specific roles as well, such as scholars, people who spend time playing the game, and scholarship managers who are active guild members who recruit and train new players. Under the scholarship model, scholarship managers usually receive a commission on rewards and revenues generated by the scholars. They also provide training to help players get better and understand how to safely use their crypto earnings, as well as the play-to-earn market. These guilds continually have a portfolio of NFTs ready to loan to players that need to borrow them to progress faster in the game. People have claimed that you can make a sustainable income from play-to-earn games, but it really depends on the player's skill, how much time they spend playing, their win rate, and the strength of the market as well. Although in general, this is a, an overemphasized claim. This all sounds good, but there are drawbacks. And when was a promising case of Axie Infinity, there's many. You have to remember that at the start, the ones with the most share of the governance tokens are the game devs and investors, which ultimately means that bad decisions could cost players big. If the game developers and publishers are known for making a string of mistakes, the project is most likely going to fail on the outset. According to Axie players from the wider community, many were made during Axie Infinity, which caused the price of Axie shards to plummet, going from an all-time high of 160 USD to its current price of 6 USD. 
The tokens themselves did not have enough or the right monetary measures to keep them at stable prices, which resulted in too high a price of a single Axie Shard token. This created a barrier of entry to new players as players started selling NFTs for higher and higher. The game was later changed by providing a free starter pack for players. As for SLP, according to the devs, the supply was very inflated as a result of too many people creating SLP by playing the game, as opposed to burning them through breeding, which was the only way you could burn the currency. Although they did introduce amulets and runes to allow SLP burning, they were taxed when sold. They also decided to eliminate an entire game mode as well as rewarding players with less SLP, essentially punishing the player base for playing the game too much. Without varying uses of tokens implemented carefully by the developers, game economies such as these can suffer in this way. Axie shards are only tied to Axie Infinity, although it is a governance token. That means that either a relatively small, bad or positive update may cause spikes or drops in the token. Other companies such as WeMade Entertainment have a portal which has many games to combat this. Delays and updates and community events such as tournaments also frayed investor and player confidence. Axie Infinity wasn't the only game to suffer in this way. In fact, when doing my research for this project, I watched one particular video by Matt's Crypto in which all of the governance tokens within these games had initially spiked and then fell quickly down to zero. Gods Unchained Alien Worlds Raid Party and My Neighbor Alice are all games that he mentioned as examples, and yet taking a look at the token price history reveals a pump and dump trend, with some coins having lost 99.5% of their value. The members of their respective communities didn't have a problem calling them out for it either. In particular, raid parties devs quickly moved to quote-unquote relaunching their game. Many users made comments about the developers rugging them. Rugging is a cryptocurrency scam in which a developer attracts investors but pulls out before the project is complete, leaving buyers with a worthless asset. Another member pointed out that even their new game was using freely available artwork on the internet as opposed to making the art themselves. However, interestingly, most of the complaints seem to revolve around one topic, which is a monetary incentive. Perhaps this is the reason that these games failed? Perhaps if they were released as standalone Web2 games, there wouldn't be such a focus on the monetary aspect, but on having fun instead, which is the original intention of video games. This sentiment was reflected by many Filipinos that originally dedicated their time to Axie Infinity. Numerous players that were interviewed by Time stated that it was boring and stressful. One particular player said that he felt fatigued all the time, and that he became more aggressive in every aspect of his life. As you can see, the opportunity for predatory applications of this technology are widespread. So why do all play-to-earn games die? To answer this question, you have to ask yourself where the money comes from to power these games. If people keep playing these games, then the money must keep coming in. Now this comes in four different forms. Firstly, they can come directly from new players that are forced to buy a starter pack to play the game. This is not sustainable as NFT prices are tied directly to the economy, which may block out players with a low income that also want to participate in the game, as it happened in Axie Infinity. Secondly, the devs can implement a membership model which is generally cheaper and better than the previous model, as everyone has the same entry fee, and so players are separated by skill. This however does not generate a lot of income for the game. Thirdly is pay to win. This I'm not going to explain as we all know what it means. But for the case of AVA, it was the addition of damage increases and added ammunition, which became the first stepping stone to the death of the original intention of the game. It also incentivizes devs to make items available which have little or no use in the game, such as character skins, which result in bloated inventory. Fourthly, advertisements in which external companies pay the devs to advertise their product or service in-game. This removes any doubt about potential malicious investments as well. This raises monthly revenues which can be portioned off for skill players, whilst the rest goes to the developers to continue developing the game, further incentivizing them. A reverse implementation of the fourth method was also supported by Mark Cuban, who showed dissatisfaction about how Sky Mavis were handling the sustainability factor of Axie Infinity, as he himself is an investor. He stated that if you couldn't get outside members and companies to interact with the game, then the income is not sustainable enough to maintain the crypto economy. This type of economy tends to be extremely volatile, and this is demonstrated in all of the graphs I showed. To add to the above, you can't also give older players the money from newer players as you'll be setting up a Ponzi scheme. In all of the cases, the question boils down to, will people pay to play that game?
Call of Duty, League of Legends, World of Warcraft, as well as CSGO are all examples of games in which players will indeed pay. However, they never intended to play it for any sort of economical game. They played it because it was fun. Does anyone remember the days of midnight launches with hundreds of people queuing up to spend money with no return on that investment other than the expectation of fun? This means that if there is a secondary incentive, money, and people see potential in it, they will make it their primary incentive, essentially meaning that if the earnings drop, people will get frustrated, which in turn compromises the fun. In essence, external monetary rewards reduces internal motivation, or fun, and becomes a catastrophic problem when the game isn't fun to begin with. The question then boils down to, does AVA need blockchain technology? I've played the game since 2010 when it was announced in 2008 by IG, and since then it's become a miracle how the game has stood the test of time. From 2010 to today, the game has been relaunched four times, mainly due to catastrophic management decisions by the original developer Red Duck, in which the situation was so bad that developers weren't getting paid. They also implemented the pay-to-win system, which although was originally inherited by the hesitant community in 2012 to 2013, later inevitably revealed itself to be one of the key factors to the game's destruction. As a result, Steam player base count went from figures of about 2,000 players on average in the EU NA regions to about 200 in 2018. The game was so successful in fact that the company were able to cons consistently host their own LAN tournaments with prize pools of up to 30,000 US dollars from 2010 to their final one in 2016. Teams such as Penta Esports also completed in these events. Although AVA dog tag, Red Duck's last attempt at saving themselves from bankruptcy failed massively on Steam, NeoWiz, their publisher from the beginning of the game in 2007, had bought the intellectual rights to AVA. Not after around two years of delays had they finally released AVA Global, and even then, the reception was generally negative at best. Somehow, the game has managed to introduce new bugs which were not present in the older build from 2018, with a full list of currently compiled reaching three pages long and took four months to fix a disastrously powerful and broken weapon, the MP7, with the community manager citing internal management issues as the reason for it. Almost every Discord announcement post prior to the belated nerf had reactions that spelled out MP7, nerf, and nerf MP7, and the clown emoji as well. However, communication was so poor between newers and the community that members such as myself had noticed many missing details in their patch note releases, up to the point where I made a guide on Steam to detail these to the community. Custom Rooms, which is a staple of the tightly knit AVA community, still hasn't been implemented, making rule set games as well as scrims impossible, which also contributed to the death of a once popular escape mode in this re-release. Finally, the implementation of a PvE mode in AVA Global was ruined completely by the introduction of PvP combat within it. However, the main problem was that no adjustments were made at all to account for the PvP element, resulting in an endlessly frustrating game mode. Trying to find someone to blame is difficult from my end, as members of the direct team for AVA are praised by community managers. And granted, the game dates back to 2007, meaning that the code may be extremely hard to maintain, especially given the ever-increasing amount of mismanagement that powered on over the years. This brick wall that Neo is formed with what are loyal community members, a great handful that have played the game since their childhood, can't be ignored, and will be instrumental in de deciding whether this game is ready for Web 3.0. However, given all of this, I've still poured in about 1200 hours into the game after only 4 months, which is a testament to the fact that although the game is frustrating to play at the moment, it has an incredible amount of potential. I personally have believed in moments of display of passion for this game that I would have successfully rivaled CSGO had it been managed properly. Could Web3 truly revive AVA? There are several factors that could in fact indicate this. Since the initial development goals that NEO has set are tied to smart contracts, if they fail their objectives, initial investors and governance token holders will get their money back. This is obviously not what the community hopes, but it is in NEO's best interest to fulfil these objectives. Once the game inherits Web3, the maintenance of the economy and therefore the success is directly tied to the game's retention, as opposed to the monetary value, as discussed earlier. In other words, the only way to make the game fun, again, is for them to apply what the community wants, with precedence given to those most loyal players, as they own the most governance tokens by default. The higher the retention, the more the in-game token is circulated, and so will the governance token. Players will need to be given the option to stake their tokens and be rewarded for that, which makes it easier to identify players that are loyal to AVA. 
This means that if implemented successfully, over time, the community may hold a majority stake in the game, which will allow the community to truly take precedence in decision making. Unlike Sky Mavis, Neowiz is a long established company that is still turning profits year on year and have maintained a good heading in general. They have the opportunity to learn from Axie Infinity's mistakes to allow not only a smoother launch, but longevity as well. Neowiz must also make sure not to incentivize investors and partners at the start too much, as the value of the tokens will be beyond what people can afford and may destroy trust between players and the game. This could easily be a way of rekindling a long, long gone relationship between the AVA community and the developers slash publishers, and I'm going to discuss ways in which it can ensure that. So how should Neowiz implement play to earn the vast possibilities? The primary method of any play to earn game is the NFTs and in-game tokens. In AVA, this may be implemented simply by earning tokens based on accumulating win rounds, but the following is what separates AVA from all other FPS games. Tokens may firstly be earned from the completion of a revamped and extended achievement system which already exists in the game. Currently, you can gain badges, medals, and ribbons which are tracked on your profile. You can also gain weapon skins after completing certain tasks with a space weapon. The skins themselves should be considered as NFTs and therefore can be sold. Tokens should be an integral part of the co-op PvE system, which as it stands is an extremely time-consuming but very fun mode. Not only is the achievement system also integrated within each mode, completing certain levels at certain difficulties, easy, normal and challenge, results in the AI dropping treasure boxes which in turn can drop NFTs of varying rarities. Doing this successfully will also serve a big portion of the casual player base, in which co-op PvE is their main point of interest, and will diversify earnings for Neowiz. Neo wish to take an already established weapon modification system and extend it so that a player can earn many different types of mods. Instead of focusing on certain weapon based statistics, the mod should extend to affecting the jump, move, run aspects as well, in order for the weapons to be customised as much as possible. These modifications can either be pre-made by Neowiz or an entire system can be made in which players can craft them using in-game tokens. One of AVA's past selling points was a variety of modes and unique weaponry. Revising this system will contribute to sustainable management of the in-game token when players are continuously crafting different weapon mods. This weapon modification system will not succeed however if there aren't many different modes. Thankfully AVA has these but there is a greater problem which AVA Global currently faces. An extremely high percentage of in-game assets are in the game files but are not used. Taking primary weapons as an example, only 23% are readily available in-game. This trend continues throughout the game, with the entire iconic PvE mode not available at all. This begs the question, will all the assets be used? What plans does Neowiz have to implement this, and will it be made 100% clear to the community? Since the release of Infinity Domination, I myself have been trying to complete my Roswell collection. There's one slight problem in that the game doesn't take into account duplicate items. One of the added benefits of the open market is the trading of any duplicate items, thus not making the game disappointing. And finally, Neowish should host esports tournaments both online and in person, as they have done many years ago, such as the AVA International Championships and their partnership with the IESF. Competitive AVA was and is still a relative, relatively potent source of retention within the current community. Applying this properly may bring back the days where teams would be flown out to Japan or Taiwan to compete in an all-expenses-paid trip. However, for the above to apply, the huge problem of freely available and effective hacks for the game needs to be addressed beforehand. Red Duck allowed trusted members of the community to ghost in in-game competitive matches in AVA Dogtag, which meant that similar to CSGO's Overwatch system, cheaters can be effectively dealt with. Whatever method they choose to implement, they need to explain how the ecosystem works, how we own our assets, and how it links in with the general gaming environment clearly to the community. The economy will then move from how much revenue can we extract from the community to how much value slash wealth can we create inside of our game that our users can access. The more content there is, the more NFTs are generated and thus the more of a cut newers will get. A win-win situation. Having had direct contact to Neowiz employees pre and post launch of Black Squad on Steam in 2017, I saw how successful it was at the start. I can't comment on how the Steam version is now as Neowiz no longer develops the game anymore, although recent reviews show a mixed response. Dedicated members and moderators of their Discord have very negative reviews. Regardless, The Loaf, a South Korean developer and publisher, decided to relaunch the game on WeMade's Layer 2 ecosystem, WeMix, called Black Squad Royal Road. Through your WeMix wallet, you can then convert Blitz or BLZ the in-game token for Black Squad Royal Road into money. 
It is worth noting here that since multiple developers own the rights to Black Squad, NS Studio themselves have also launched a play to -earn version of the game through their new gaming platform, GameTree, with their own coin. Although the Blitz token is practically worthless now, there are some good takeaways which may suggest how NeoWiz are to approach a very possible Web3 AVA Global. As part of their pre-OBT, they distributed 100,000 USD worth of funds to the community in order to onboard members back into their game. 70,000 USD was sanctioned off to the top 100 ranked. A similar system can be implemented to the top 100 players for AVA's arena system, which will highly incentivize previously lower competitive players to retry the game. Many of these Previous players are currently high-profile members of the esports community, such as Shaka, who has a massive following on Twitch, as well as Skududu, who has a history of major LAN tournament appearances. The rest of the money was sectioned off to sponsors, who are players that bet on other players' success before the game starts, effectively gambling, as well as lucky players, players that were randomly chosen to receive the rest of the pool, which isn't a bad idea to initially involve as many people as possible. We've now effectively come back full circle. At the start of the video I talked about how I came to know of Remade Entertainment. Over the past year, however, Neos have been busy developing their own Layer 2 network, connecting themselves to the Ethereum blockchain, or Layer 1. They've partnered up with Polygon, an Indian firm that has partnerships with the likes of Ubisoft and Atari to provide a Web3 gaming platform which will host all of Neowiz's upcoming Web3 games. The gaming platform is called IntelliX and will eventually host a DEX or decentralized exchange as well as an IntelliX wallet where players can earn IntelliX tokens and an NFT marketplace where you can sell and trade your earnings from AVA along with other games. The biggest and most mysterious clue as to why I believe that the traditional AVA that we all know and love will inherit this technology is the use of the general trademark AVA. This points to the entire franchise being published rather than a specific game, as Neewas are also currently developing an MMO based on AVA called Project AVA to be released in 2023. Having spoken to Intella staff, they kindly provided me with all the details I knew at the time as well as relevant interviews and articles. They explicitly stated that due to blockchain gaming being banned in South Korea, the fact that Neewas were holding interviews for Project AVA in the country pointed to the greater possibility that Project AVA will actually be a Web2 game instead. Having thoroughly read Intella's white paper, AVA is also listed under the genre FPS, whereas other game releases are clearly stated to be under the MMORPG genre. Earlier, when discussing the available methods of generating money in the play-to-earn industry, I mentioned advertisements as the best method. Neowiz have already implemented this in their December 2022 update via Simo Media, which adds to the list of signs of a Web3 implementation. Adding to that, Black Squad, a similarly older game run on UE3, has also been released as a UE3, UE4, Web3 game, which further indicates the expansion of Web3 from the typical MMORPG to the FPS format as well. It is also interesting to note that Neo has decided to invest in a server in South Korea, for AVA, whilst at the same time placing IP restrictions for their own people. This is pure speculation, but the intention here may be to prepare a play-to-earn release of AVA that will include the South Korean population once the current ban on blockchain gaming is to be lifted. Neowiz have gone to great lengths and have made great investments proven by the future implementation of popular games such as Cats and Soup into this new network. The fact that Neowiz also took hold of AVA after Red Duck's bankruptcy is alone an indicator of their willingness to develop the game and franchise. Although the treatment of the community thus far has been just shy of appalling, this, counterintuitively, may have been a result of their focus on the long term. They may now have an incentive to properly sustain AVA. IntelliX is proof that they are planning to look beyond their feet. If prioritizing this decentralized method of thinking that they are pushing for is tainted in any way by greed, as has been evident by many varying traditional Web3 developers and publishers, then Neowiz will have hosted their biggest failure yet. Having said that, Intel have a lot to learn from other platforms such as Remix, and have boasted a team which has great industry experience as per their white paper. And I'll be going through the white paper now. A white paper is essentially a detailed plan of action. To start, Intel uses a newly proposed consensus mechanism called proof of contribution, where validators are quantified in terms of their contributions calculated by an algorithm. This will reward the most loyal participants. Players are specifically awarded by providing liquidity or currency in order to fulfill transactions on IntelliX. They also state that periodic reports will be disclosed to the community to maintain a transparent and credible platform service, which is a good display of communication. Implementation of reserves in emergency situations are also disclosed to the community. IntelliX itself will be available as a mobile app and as a browser extension, showing the extent to which they are going to roll out this platform. 
They also have a separate system for implementing new games into the ecosystem called NFT Launchpad and a marketplace to sell these NFTs at quote unquote low fees. Among the planned rollout is the Growth Beacon Fund, which essentially is a fraction of funds reserved for new release games on the platform. According to the tokenomics, the highest portion of tokens is allocated to the ecosystem, meaning more is available to maintain a sustainable economy, obviously depending on how it is used. Some mechanics, such as a robust burn mechanism, will be used to quote-unquote maintain a delicate balance between supply and demand. Although IntelliX are currently about to implement the second stage of its roadmap, taking a look at the third stage reveals a list of games prepared for release, among which AVA is listed as an FPS. This confirms that Project AVA will indeed not be the expected release on this platform. Now effectively, the success of AVA is dependent on the entire portfolio that IntelliX hosts. This means that they can't afford to let AVA trail behind some of their much bigger games. Conversely, what would happen if AVA were to be successful, whereas other games on their ecosystem are to trail behind? Also, you have to think about the fact that since Steam has forbidden the publishing of blockchain games on its platform, if there are two identical versions of AVA available to the public, similar to Black Squad, the already struggling player base will become even more diluted and thus divided. Okay, so now I'm going to give my personal opinions on the matter. I want to start off by going through the disclaimer on the white paper, which will sum up my attitude not only to AVA and IntelliX, but the general play-to-earn sphere. In essence, the disclaimer states that if anything goes wrong, we had nothing to do with it. There's no regulation, which means there's effectively no proper way of applying quality control. This also means that existing governmental decisions can have an adverse effect on this ecosystem, causing massive losses or gains. The disclaimer explicitly states that the platform disclaims any responsibility from losses, even if it is as a result of their own actions. The point that I'm trying to make here is that being sceptical is healthy, but gaining information on emerging technologies should balance that scepticism. In the case of AVA, given that I'm currently the highest legitimately ranked player, as in I didn't use bots, with the most active playtime in the game, I personally wouldn't be considering IntelliX in any way as an investment opportunity, and neither should you. Another incident which has caused me to lose confidence in Neoz's ability to handle the community is with a relatively high-profile community member, Appy, in which a list of rewards for a premium capsule were wrong. After sending an email to request compensation, Neoz didn't reply until a month later, and although they had refunded the premium currency he had initially bought with, obviously for false advertising, they decided to extract that back from his account not more than 24 hours after the actual delivery, and compensated him with 10 titaniums instead. For reference, the cheapest titanium item you can buy is 30 times this amount. There's also this big issue I have with play to earn, that is the meaning of purpose it gives to the human population. The Philippines, as discussed above, had a one-time case, and as a result, the country's inability to weather COVID-19 created a perfectly timed situation for their people to inherit Axie Infinity. However, the general standard can't be based on a highly unlikely event, such as COVID-19. Although I'm imagining a gaming industry wholly based on play-to-earn, the issue of people's psychological and physiological health will probably be a further risk, exclusively due to the monetary incentive. People have made it easy to allow themselves to be deluded into fake promises such as that by Axie Infinity and became addicted. Given that it's easy to follow the hype train, you may end up losing a lot more than you started with. You can refer to the case study which is linked in the description to see how people have experienced play-to-earn. Following on from the case of the Philippines, wealth inequality, which is a primary cause of poverty, is as a result of the implementation of interest and interest rates as opposed to charity. Interest allows wealthy people to create free money from taking advantage of people who are naturally short on time or resources, thus creating an imbalance which only grows with time. Games like these do not solve the problem of wealth inequality. It is a short-term band-aid, and that's given the unlikely assumption that scam projects do not exist. Remember, this industry is still not regulated, since most, if not all, economies are not charity-based, situations of poverty are common throughout the world. The only reason people are earning as much as they are within these game economies is because those that are wealthy and invested in it are solely looking for a return. This links to a greater general problem with the world, but must be stated, and a video explaining why interest is banned, particularly in Islam, is linked below. A part of their main lineup of projects and games to be hosted on IntelliX include virtual casino and gambling games, which I particularly do not want to be a part of. With the blockchain system, however, Neowiz needs to listen to us for their sake, and simply accumulating enough game time and skill will allow that to happen if the community is big enough. You also have to remember that Neowiz isn't perfect. There's been a far-reaching number of AAA studios that have released catastrophic projects, including, but definitely not limited to, Anthem, Battlefield 2042, which was worked on by three different studios as part of EA, 
Mass Effect Andromeda are most notoriously Fallout 76. What I'm looking for is newest to be the next Hello Games. Instead of continuously milking a game for its already existing game assets, they should put their head down and produce evidence of their loyalty to the game, and thus the community. This is rather an exciting path that we might experience as a community, and that may further the 15 year old game we all love, but only the future will show which side of the coin is truly face up. To end, I want to leave you with a question that you should ask yourselves. Does AVA need a blockchain ecosystem? Thank you for listening.